over nine months by using Java and to teaching, introduce him to computer programming. And of course, I have Michael Kohling, you know, I mean, I'm sure all of you know Michael Kohling, he's a Greenfoot fame, and he will be giving his experience of, you know, what Greenfoot is, what Blue Jay is, and he'll be talking about that. So in terms of the slides, what I'm thinking is I'm going to go through why, uh, how to introduce programming to kids, you know, and this is again purely based upon personal experience. Your mileage may vary, and you may have to adapt it per your child. In each child is different, and then I'm going to talk about some of the tools that we used on the way, um, and what he did and what he learned from them, which tool was helpful to him in which particular aspect. So the, the typical question that people ask me is, what is a good age to introduce programming? There is really no clear answer to it, and again, it all depends upon your child's ability. But in my opinion, like I have two boys, a four-year-old and a ten-year-old. A four-year-old, I think, is a good age to start introducing them to programming. When you think of program, don't think of it as the syntax. Don't think of it as, oh, whether will he be able to write a for loop and things like that. Think of it as logical structuring. You know, if your kid is able to place the Lego blocks on each other, he's doing logical structuring already. That's how I see it. You know, is he able to understand the mathematical concepts together, like simple additions? So I think those are the very, very basic fundamentals of programming. And that's how literally, you know, it started with my little one and the elder one as well. Uh, analytical skills, those are equally important. You know, given this and this, can you derive, can you analyze this situation and find a solution for it? So think of that as sort of the very basis. Those basic skills need to be developed first before you start realizing the potential. You know, if you realize that your son or daughter is really, you know, sharp at those kind of skills, that's sort of a symbol or a signal to you. Oh, you know what? Now they, can, they are groking those basic concepts. Let me introduce them to programming. And the, again, the introduction has to be very subtle, very gentle. You need to make sure it is fun. That is the most important part with kids. The moment you start, make it boring. You make it you know, non-interactive. They'll just doze off and they'll, they'll be hungry. They want to go to the bathroom. All sorts of things start happening. Another important part that I learned through the lesson is <clears throat> analogies. So you want to talk about programming. You want to talk about coding, you want to talk about Java, but give analogies from their daily life. And I'll show several samples on how I did it. For example, when I was teaching Java, you know, like last weekend I did a workshop at my home with 10 kids where we taught them Minecraft programming. Well, how many of you have heard of Minecraft? Yeah, when we guys say notch for president, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> these guys are all Minecrafters. So he said, okay, I'm going to show you how to build a Minecraft mod. Now then I'm talking their language right away. So these guys quickly understood the concepts required for Minecraft programming. And then at the end of the workshop, literally five hours, these kids, <clears throat> no programming experience, no language experience. Within five hours, they wrote their first Hello World program, and they actually built a Minecraft mod. So I'll share all those experiences all along. And incentives are important. So like, for example, going back to the Minecraft workshop, their incentive was, you know, actually building a mod. The 10 kids that came to the workshop, I mean, every time I will ask them, what are we here for? They don't care about Java programming or, you know, NetBeans or JDK. No, I'm here to build a Minecraft mod. That incentive in their mind was very clear. And it has to be something that strong an incentive which will keep them motivated. Then you don't have to motivate them. Instead, if you say, oh, I'm going to build a financial stock trade application, they don't care a damn about it. You know, they don't really care about it. This is something that they connect in their daily life. It has to be fun. It has to be incentivized, which is what they connect with. And I think that was really the key to me. So last summer, um, when my son was nine years old, he attended a summer camp. And in the summer camp, his first, very first introduction to programming was using Scratch. How many of you have heard the tool Scratch? Excellent, yeah. So that is sort of the very first programming tool that he started learning with. It's basically a 2D visual programming tool. You don't need to know any Java syntax for it or any programming language syntax for it. Um, idea is you drag and drop blocks from the, you know, it's a, first of all, it's an IDE. In the IDE, you drag and drop blocks. And I'll show you how the programming works. You fit the blocks together, which basically 
becomes a script and then it's a visual execution so you know you create a sprite first of all and a sprite has a character say a dog or a cat or a frog and then you say okay i want this dog to take five steps forward five steps backward so literally that is sort of the default sprite over there or i think it's a cat character uh, so it just takes five steps forward five steps backward and then you click on the green button and the visual execution happens so the beauty of that is you load up the ide and you, know, you drag a block you create a sprite and you say run so literally in two commands you got the program running and then you say oh you know how about we add a sound to it so then then the cat is taking five steps forward clapping coming back and doing a different clap sound there is another block for that so they get the basic logical structure of the program oh i'm doing actually a for loop or i'm doing a while loop without actually formally learning the technology so there is no need for them to remember any syntax at all it's literally visual drag and drop um and folks have made whole bunch of projects using scratch um games um stories music all possible combinations that they have made um it definitely t- makes them think systematically oh i have to do like take five steps forward so you drag a block each block takes one step forward you put the number 5 over there now it's going to take five step forward so it gives them that structure that is required for them to think systematically so this is the ide that how it looks like when you build up scratch so on the left hand side you can see there are a bunch of uh, blocks for programming sprites and these are the blocks that i was talking about so for example this one says here play sound this one says play sound until done stop all sounds so you just literally drag and drop those blocks and then you associate watch wave file to be played and things like that so very simple very intuitive um my son um i think he did about two classes on it in a week and then he was pretty proficient and on the top here for example you can see there is motion looks sound pen there are different categories so they just look at the category and it shows all the blocks that are available drag and drop attach them together and run now this is where you drag and drop the blocks these are your different sprites these are your different characters okay now my kids they play skylanders um and they they swear by skylanders all the time you know they know all the different characters in there that's where it comes with you know connecting with your daily life so my little one you know he is 4 4 years old so he asked little he asked his elder brother you know what brother how about we make a game of skylanders so that's how i got him my little one four little four and a half years old i got him introduced to scratch now so you see there are four correct three characters over there these are skylanders i think hothead thumpback and eruptor if i got the names right no he said i want to build a game where they're throwing fireballs at each other they're throwing water balls at each other because that's the game he plays that's the game that's the vocabulary he connects with if you show them hey you know what whatever game you want i can build it here that got him got him excited right away and literally you know dragging and dropping these blocks i'll show you the game as well they have multiple sprites here like fire or fireball or eruptor or thumbback or hothead and then you put all the blocks together and the game is ready so after learning the scratch programming in like for in about two classes my elder son could literally put this game in about half an hour so this is a, a quick preview of the game now you realize the game is nothing fancy but you know it's it, all is doing is is throwing fireballs and the other person is throwing water bu- water um, buckets um, at hothead but the idea is the whole logic logic of thinking oh you know what that guy is actually moving so i need to make sure i exact extract its coordinates while it's moving and then i'm able to throw the ball in that direction so those logical thinking that analytical skills are very important and that's what he got um one of the cool things about scratch is there are they have a mechanism by which you create a game and then you can publish a game you can share it there are already 3.1 million plus scratch games that are available these are the projects that folks have created kids have created and they uh, publish them on the um, scratch website um the target age although they say 8 to 16 years but most of the time if you have a younger kid 
then the uh, other uh, other elder kid and the younger siblings just tag along and then they pick up skills really fast right so this one has all the references like for wiki you know wiki has all the details of course uh, you can, um, there is a specific section which is targeted towards educators so if you want to teach scratch to your kids then there's a sec separate section on that and the reference guide is pretty neat too Alice. Now, Alice is the second environment, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a later. But uh, why my son didn't like it particularly? Uh, this is a, a FOSS effort by University of Virginia and Carnegie Mellon. Um, it teaches you object-oriented concepts primarily. Now, it's all event-driven. Instead of 2D, this is a 3D environment. So you can create a full 3D environment, X, Y, Z coordinates go back and forth. You can build your, you can whatever you can imagine. You can put it into the drawing into the canvas of Alice for example there are three core issues that they try to solve um, so it teach the programming theory because you have to really un understand what the domain is uh, what the lay of the land is how the objects are moving around in the land um, the beauty is there is no syntax to remember just like scratch and then third one is which is why my son didn't like it particularly if you see the logo it is specifically targeted towards middle school girls and the moment he sees middle school girls, his hands were off right away. He says, oh, I don't like this. This is not good. This is not good. That is not good. Then he started making excuses. <laughs> I personally didn't try it, um, but that was his feedback. Um, and because if you think about Alice, the way this was, the program was built, it was actually built for storytelling. And girls are really good at storytelling. They really wanted to promote computer science to girls in middle schools, and that's the target. And that's not a boy kind of thing. So he said, no, I'm hands off. But if you realize, you know, if, if, the, if you bring up the Alice IDE, it looks pretty similar. You know, you have your scene view, which is in this case, of course, a 3D, because you can lay the objects in the 3D land. You have your different objects and functions. So you at least understand the concept of, you know, what a block is, what a function is. I'm going to call this function. This function is going to do something for me, things like that. And then here is where you start editing the code. And because he didn't do much with Alice, so I'm going to conclude with one slide here, uh, where I'm saying it's basically taught for uh, middle school girls. Um, there are all different kinds of installers available. There's even a NetBeans plugin available. So if you're using NetBeans IDE, that is something that you can try by yourself. Download the NetBeans plugin for Alice and see how it fits it in over there. And of course, this is um, supported by Oracle as well. And with that, I will actually let Michael take over from here. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Michael Kerling. I'm from the University of Kent, and I'm the project lead for the Greenfoot and Blue Jay environments. Um, I will just talk for a few minutes here, not very long. This is really Aaron's talk today, and Aaron had planned to talk about Greenfoot and Blue Jay, and he's perfectly capable of doing that. But because I was here on site anyway, he kindly invited me to do these bits. Um, so I will talk about those two systems. Um, Greenfoot is um, a system where the teaching changes a little bit compared to Scratch and Alice. Scratch and Alice both avoid textual syntax by having these drag and drop blocks that you just stick together like Lego bricks. Um, with Greenfoot, we're getting into real text-based text -based Java programming. It is still a uh, graphical educational environment, so Greenfoot is, a, is also an educational um, programming environment to teach programming to kids. Um, the age group is just slightly older, so we typically say, to be conservative, we say sort of 13, 14 years upwards. That is, aimed, that remark is aimed at teachers, so if they have whole school classes where you have average children, um, it's typically about 13 years of age or so where they can all cope. If you have really engaged, interested, bright kids, you can go younger, as Aaron said with his son. Um, so it is a graphical system. Um, in the output, but the programming itself is textual. So what it looks like, if I... Sometimes it goes tricky. You may have to click okay. on the arrow here. Click on, yeah, there you go. Oh, All right. there we are. So we have various different views here. Um, it is a multi-window system. So the main window um, looks like this. It shows what we call the world. Uh, so it's a graphical display, and it has a diagram at the side 
um, showing the classes that are involved in the project. So you get, when you execute the program, you get graphical animated output. So you see your characters moving around. But the programming itself, once you open a class, you get a fairly traditional looking text editor. So you get a textual editor with standard Java code. And that is really standard Java and that it runs with a standard Java compiler on the standard JVM. Um, the difference is that there are, that it's a framework that has a number of methods available that makes, make it really easy and quick to get animated graphics on screen. So we often start with school kids that have no programming experience at all and after 10 or 15 minutes they have graphical characters running around on screen. And that is just because the Greenfoot framework um, provides methods that make it very easy to get these um, graphics on screen. This screenshot here shows um, code completion that makes it a bit um, easier to enter those uh, methods. And you see there are methods such as turn and turn left and so on. So, so moving and turning is, is very easy and very straightforward. So what happens there is that you can with so high school kids very quickly um, build simple computer games and one of the nice things about having this graphical display is that you actually see the program executing. So where in, in, in no more formal traditional programming you have to do some testing to see whether your program works. Here you don't really have to test, you see when the program doesn't behave as you expect. So you execute the program because you typically see characters running around if you have you know, a game where a character runs around and tries to avoid something or catch something. If it doesn't behave as you expect, you notice. You can actually see the program executing. And that is one of the really motivating and educational valid things. What we typically say to students and to teachers is different. There are two views on it. One view is the, the view of the kids. They view it as a game building environment. They think they're cre creating computer games. And if you're teaching them, if you're the instructor or the, or the father or mother or teacher, um, then it is an environment to teach about um, programming concepts. So essentially we sneak the concepts in sort of under the surface without them noticing. We don't go to the kids and say, today we teach programming. We say, you know, today you can build a computer game. There is a large amount of material available. There is here is a sequence of tutorial videos. We also have written tutorials, but we have video tutorials as, as well. Um, there is a website called The Green Room, which has a lot of teaching material in there for instructors, and that doesn't have to be formal teachers. It can be also just parents, or if you want to run an after-school club. Um, the only thing we keep out of The Green Room is the kids themselves. We just don't let pupils in there, because there are teachers talking about you know, their, their assignments and their exams also about what they don't know. You know if, if the kids are listening and a teacher can't say, I have no idea what I'm doing, can someone help me? I need to teach tomorrow. Um, but, but they actually do in the green room because they know they're among friends there. Um, Greenfoot and Bluejay are both supported by Oracle already for many years. They are very generously supporting us. Um, here is a screenshot of a game that Aaron's son built. So this is, you can see um, that you can make a lot of things move around on screen quite easily. There's a very nice progression from Scratch, where Scratch is object-based, but a lot of the concepts are quite similar. So in Scratch you don't have classes, you just program every individual object, which is easier initially, but of course, because you don't have classes, creating multiple instances of the same kind is actually quite hard. And so there's a nice progression when they run into, into sort of the boundary where Scratch can't do anymore what they want to do, then they can graduate to Greenfoot, and suddenly instead of having one cat, you can have 100 cats running around. I think one thing that I would like to highlight here, <clears throat> like if you go back to the previous slide, over the, oh, echo. Okay. <laughs> so in the previous slide, I think this is probably not emphasized enough. If there is one thing that you want to learn about Greenfoot, this is the Joy of Code series. So my son started playing around with Joy of Code series. These are short 10-minute tutorials on Greenfoot. They start with a very basic hello world kind of thing, and then they build you an entire game. Um, short 10-minute video, there are about 35 episodes over here. And um, other than one or two episodes where he actually posted a comment on the blog and got a response back, 
he was able to walk through it all by himself. And that to him was the first live Java coding experience. That's when he started asking me the questions around, um, what is a Java doc? I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> then he started explaining him the concept of Java doc. Then that's when he asking, oh, I'm creating a new class, but a new method, and it's not being visible. That's when we talked about accessors, you know, what is it by public, private, and things like that. So I, I think that was really not emphasized enough, and that is just a beautiful piece of work, and those are all recordings that Michael has done. It's just a fantastic piece of work. You know, 35 episodes, 10 to 12 minutes each, really bootstrap you in a really fast way. And the game that is shown on the next slide, after going through those tutorials, he could literally build that game in like about half an hour. And really here, imagination is your limit. You know, all he's doing is he's putting a whole bunch of leaves, you know, there are cars running around, there are rockets running around, you bump each other, and then you make a method, oh, if the car and the rocket are bumping, then the rocket eats the car, and then the car disappears. So the whole concept of, you know, how do you make sure that the two objects are interacting, how to make an object disappear, or I'm going to eat the leaves, or I'm going to eat the cake, then I'm going to get five points. Oh, I'm getting five points, but it's not a static variable, so the points are not staying with me. Then you introduce the concept of static variables. The basic programming concepts comes in very handy. If you're interested to hear more about that, I have a session tomorrow in the late afternoon here at the conference where I talk for a whole hour about Greenfoot and actually show you the code and show you how to build this. So if you're still around tomorrow late afternoon, come back and have another look. Um, I just want to take one minute very briefly to talk about another system that is BlueJ. Um, it is a second separate educational programming system and uh, that sounds very similar at first, so we often get the question, you know, what's the difference here? Um, BlueJ is a, um, an educational programming environment that we built initially for teaching at about introductory university level, so it was aimed at first year university level. Um, so it comes conceptually a bit after Greenfoot. It is also a Java environment, so it's standard Java text-based. In fact, the text editor is the same as in Greenfoot. Um, the difference is that this is really a generic um, development environment, just like Eclipse or NetBeans, but with different tools, where Greenfoot is specialized to build one certain class of application that is really two-dimensional graphical interactive applications. Um, BlueJ doesn't do that. BlueJ is a generic environment. You can build any application. You can build you know, network applications that don't have a GUI. It, it's, a, it's a generic program environment, so it's not specialized as Greenfoot is. So, it, for example, producing graphics in BlueJ is much harder. It's just as hard as it is in NetBeans or Eclipse. There's no specific environment support for it. And, but in return, it is um, you start with a blank screen and you build a whole application. You don't have this framework there that you have in Greenfoot, um, which means you, you, you see the whole code that runs. You get a better understanding. And it has educational tools. It, is qu it looks quite different from Eclipse or NetBeans in that what you see on screen initially is not lines of code. You see initially a diagram, a class diagram of the applications you have, and then you can interact with the classes and the objects. You can interactively create single objects, and then you can interactively invoke individual methods of objects. So you can play around with parts of your applications much, much more than in traditional professional environments. And what that does for you is it, um, it reinforces an understanding of object-oriented principles, of how objects communicate, how, what methods do, and you can test much more quickly and, and you, you typically develop in smaller increments and test more often because you don't have to write test drivers. So that is the other system. Um, again, it is written in Java. It runs on all sorts of different systems. It is also supported by Oracle, so we are very um, lucky to have a fairly stable support over a long time, first by Sun Microsystems and now by Oracle. And the Oracle Academy is also using those systems. I'll hand over again to Aaron, and you can continue Thank you. with your talk. Another, <clears throat> another way I got my son introduced to programming, he's a big Lego fan. I mean, all the boys are Lego fan. I mean, they love Legos, building structures. But Lego is not just about building structures. Uh, Lego Mindstorms are 
programmable robots. Um, it comes with a small brick. Um, you can actually, it comes with its own NXT OS and comes with its own programming language. Um, and it's a bot. In the bot, you can atti attach all the different, um, different Lego pieces. It comes with a, essentially a full kit by itself. There are about 500 pieces that comes that can be attached to the bot and you can build all kind of fancy structures. Not only that, they also have this thing called as First Lego League or FLL. Now, as part of the first Lego League, what they do is they arrange yearly competitions, uh, which happens every year all around the world. Literally in about 65 plus countries, these competitions happen. So in those competitions, what they do is they build a, uh, a big uh, sheet and the sheet, the, a field. A field is like eight by four feet. And in that field, they will define missions. So for example, last year, the mission was around food safety. So they were saying, okay, this is where your bot is placed. I'm going to show you a video of that. But your bot is placed here. It has to go around the field, avoid these obstacles, accomplish a mission, and come back. So you're not just building structures, but you're actually commanding the robot to do a certain thing. And just to get you a feel of you know, what all comes in there in terms of how much it can be customized, you have an NXT brick, which is your main bot, and I'll show you a picture of that. You've got tons of sensors, motors, connection cables, and the complete NXT GUI, which allows you to build the program itself. Um, not only that, things get more interesting. Um, for example, the NXT brick comes with, by default, NXT OS, which is, you know, it allows you to create, again, block-based programming. You can go a step forward. You can say, you know what? I'm going to burn it with Legos which is basically a Java operating system on it. Now you can issue your basic Java commands to the brick. You can, you can, you're programming in Java, you run your Java classes on the NXT brick, and you're running it. So all your experience of like Scratch, you know, Bluefoot, GreenJ, all of that can be leveraged. Now this is one thing that we have planned for this summer break, and hopefully we'll play around with this. I actually wanted to do this almost last year, but he was getting ready for his FLL competition, so we couldn't really dig deeper into it. My hand was slapped by my wife. This is a preview of how the NXT programming toolkit looks like. Um, this is a program that he actually made. Uh, you can see there are, uh, there are different uh, compile cycles over here. There's a toolbar which is not visible, which is where you drag and drop the blocks. So you're telling the robot, go 10 blocks straight to define what a block is. Or say, go 10 spins of the wheel straight, then take a left turn, then take a right turn, or turn so much angle. And the idea is, because your field is fixed at 8 by 4, you run it again and again. Reproducibility is very, very, very important. Because in, it's a, in an 8 by 4 field, in the real competition, is 2 and a half minutes. You have to accomplish as many missions as you can in 2 and a half minutes. So not only they learn how to program the robot, but they have to be very efficient. That the robot goes from here, achieves a mission, brings the mission back, then runs, go do the next thing, brings it back to the mission. So I think it gets very exciting. And I'll show you the video, which will give you an idea as well. This is a model of their bot. Uh, here, what you see is the real this is just the brick basically and here they have ethernet adapters over here these are all the different lego pieces over here um, as part of the competition you're required to build this bot you can see there are you know, different sensors attached over here these are different attachments and jigs that they have made um, and if you go to the competition like the way my son was there were 48 teams cooperating over there over competing with each other everybody had a very unique design so not only you're thinking by yourself you take a look at other models as well. Hey, you know what? How their bot is different. How do I build a better bot? You know, how are their machines, how, their mich how they are accomplishing their machines, their missions in a more efficient way. So you come back to your own design board and redesign your bot or redesign your missions. So all those basic team dynamics, you know, they come into their mind as well. Now, this is a actual competition. You know, this is a first LEGO League competition. This is what they participated. So let this video play. Um, well, this is the field that I'm talking about. This is an 8 by 4 field. Um, these are, it was a food safety mission. So here, the idea was, for example, there are four medicine bottles. There are three are orange, one is green, and they can be in any order. The bot should be able to identify which one is a green bottle, 
pick it and bring it back. So then the idea was, oh, they need to understand how does a color sensor work. So put the color sensor, sense the bottle. Once you sense the bottle, then go forward, pick the bottle, come back, and then retract all the way back here. This was a sensor signal. So like if you are in distress, you raise this sensor signal. So the bot has to travel all the way here, come back here, lift up, and raise the sensor signal. So all these different missions, they get them really excited. Now, this is a mission where, um, for example, they have to climb the stair. So how do you program the bot to climb the stairs? Or if you can't climb the stairs, then go around, make your calculation, and then climb up here. So all sorts of fun missions. Let me play the video. Oh, hold on. Let me actually put the audio output. That'll be easy. <laughs> oh, we lost it completely. Okay, never mind. Let's go this way. So you can see how the they actually push the dog. They pull the dog inside. It's a helper dog, basically. And you can see how the kids are learning through transition. You can see the excitement in the kids. They need to learn the team dynamics. They know exactly it's two and a half minutes. They need to do the entire drill within that, or they lose the points. So these are the color tiles they need to put right, align them over here. They pull a chair, helping chair back. So the mission goes on and on and on and on. And there are lots of missions. I think one of the most exciting missions, one of the most exciting missions that they did was, um, and I think one of the players is going to do it, he's going to place the bot here. So this is a line over here. This is a black line. It's not a straight line, by the way. It is tilted, and then it takes another turn over there. They built a program on the NXT bot for which they actually got an innovation award, which was a line following algorithm. So how do you, you know, just randomly put a bot where the bot just adjusts itself, follow the line, and then wherever the line goes, they just goes along with the line. So it, it was a lot of learning experience, not just the programming part of it, but the logical, the analytical, the team dynamics, the transitions, all of that turned out really handy. And you can see the guys in the white and black, they're the referees, they're actually monitoring it, what is right, what is not right, and they can they assign points to you accordingly. Oh, believe me, I can watch this video many, many times. Okay, we have some time, okay. Well, I think I'll go to the next slide. All right, um, most of you are familiar with Minecraft, but Minecraft is a game, um, where you basically place blocks and break blocks. That's in the very short term. And in terms of placing blocks, think of it as an infinite bucket of Lego. All sorts of Legos. You, know, you can place them, break them. That's how the game started. Now, over a period of time, the game really picked up pace in the sense that um, you can do um, all sorts of creative structures you know, that you can build over there. And I'll show some samples of that. Uh, there are different modes in the game, creative, survival, adventure, hardcore, and there are subtle differences in amounts of supplies that you have or things you can do or capable or whether you die in the game or you don't die in the game. Those are there. One of the coolest things about the game is redstone. Building and placing blocks is okay. Now you can be really creative. You can work with other players to build those structures as well. But redstone is an awesome concept in the game of Minecraft. It is basically all about logic gates. It says on and off. That's it. Now, using that, you can start connecting you know, your different logic gates. It could be and, and it's on and off, basically. So you can say, oh, I'm going to build an XOR gate now. I'm going to build an XNOR gate. Those are, again, very, very simple examples. People have built, using these redstones, they have built a full 16-bit ALU. So you give it an input, and it actually generates an output. 
all sorts of stuff. So very extensive stuff. I mean, people have built a Sudoku solver, for example, using the redstone gates. So think about you know how much logic and understanding you have to build. Now these are not necessarily built by younger kids, but you'll be surprised. Some of them are actually built by really young kids because you know they are spending like up to four hours on Minecraft. You may think, hey, they're just playing a game, but understand from the perspective how much they are learning in playing that game. Um, there is a you can download the game of course free you can play for it you know on a single computer you can you, there is a multiplayer version as well which is where you pay the money that's all for the programming model um, they even have a yearly minecon I mean it has happened twice so far once in Las Vegas once in Paris uh, so it's called as a minecon where all the minecrafters get together and then they geek out um, here is for example one creative construction this is Europe they're built on 1 is to 1500 scale. Just built out of Minecraft blocks. And you can dig deep, deep, deep. So they're understanding geography, all different concepts. So it's not easy. Another example that they learned, built is USS Enterprise. So these folks, these kids are getting together and then they're building all these structures. And this may, I mean, I don't know about this particular one, but typically a bunch of kids get together and they say, you know what? Hey, how about you work on this part of the structure? I built on this part of the structure and then we combine them together. Once again, you're learning the team concepts, team dynamics. Now, the way, I mean, up until my, the way my son was playing it, I said, okay, fine, he's playing just another game, he's having fun. One day he told me, hey dad, my program is corrupted because my jar is not working. Ting, ting, that rings a bell. What do you mean jar is not working? Then he told me, hey, you know what? The game is actually built using Java. I said, oh, cool. Let's take a look at your jar. So then we fixed this problem. And then he told me about Minecraft mods. Well, Minecraft mod basically stands for modifications, which is basically allowing you to modify the game from which it was originally designed for. Now, <clears throat> Minecraft game itself has a certain play. You know, there's a certain game play. You can go through three different worlds, play around, break, break and play structures. But there are certain aspects of the game. So, for example, in his case, well, when you're placing a block or breaking a block, he says, you know what? At the end of the game, I want to find out how many blocks I placed and broke. Minecraft, the game, original game, does not show that information. So Minecraft has this concept of building a mod by which you can extend the game. It's not an official API, but Bucket is a developer API. I mean, this is something that they have acquired. Uh, the Mojang company, which has built the game, has acquired the, acquired the team. And then they're working very actively to make that as an official modding API. But using that modding API, you can build a mod, which is basically a jar file. It's, it's an extensible game, which is basically a jar file. You build that game. Uh, or the or the mod which has predefined files and configuration files and then you drop the game into minecraft server voila you have that functionality available to you so he felt very empowered oh cool i can write this mod now i can know exactly my block count bingo for example um, <clears throat> i was talking to a friend of his and he says when i crouch in the game i can fall off and i have to hold two keys for crouching how about you just say one key and then it stays crouched till I don't press another key. So the idea is, you know, the kids are feeling empowered by building these mods. Now, to give you an idea, Bucket is a developer API, Craft Bucket is a server. Now, Minecraft by itself is not moddable, so Craft Bucket has built a Minecraft version which can be moddable, and then they release uh, right along with Minecraft itself. So Minecraft is version 1.1. Similarly, Craft Bucket is version 1.5. Oh, sorry. Minecraft is version 1.5. Similarly, Craft Bucket is version 1.5. So you can download a compatible server and then write a mod around it. Another concept that they learn with the game of Minecraft is modularity. Now in Minecraft, basically what you're doing is you're going around the universe and essentially the game is huge in terms of the lay of the land. Um, it's, I read somewhere on the statistics, it's literally 1.5 times the radius of Earth. So you can keep traveling, you will never see an end effectively. So they learn the concept of modularity because you can configure a distance how far you can see and based upon that, that many modules are loaded or unloaded. And it was surprising when I started playing around with mods, the kids you know, who are playing the Minecraft game, 
they spend as much time playing the game they actually spend more time on the wiki there's a minecraft wiki where they're reading all the details so when i started playing around with minecraft mod and i started asking questions oh what is this file for and what is this jar file what is this kind he knew all of it he knew all of it the configuration oh move this file here and change this and you're ready to go i said oh okay i can focus on actually building the mod for you you do the configuration for it Just to give you an idea, this is uh, a chart from their blog, uh, and it, the game was originally written in Java, uh, but now has been ported to different platforms, so Xbox and Pocket Edition. Pocket Edition runs on iOS and Android, um, and it shows basically the sales um, of the different editions. On the day of the Christmas, there were 75,000 copies, and it's about 26.99. Okay, there were 75,000 copies of the game sold on the day of the Christmas. And you can go to minecraft.net slash stats and it will show you how many copies were sold the day before. Constantly, constantly they're selling thousands of copies every day. And these are purchases, not just downloads. So how did that help him? Well, that was the, when we, so last winter break, we spent some time doing a Minecraft mod. I said, okay, you know what, tell me what mods do you want to build? Let's build a Minecraft mod and we built a few mods. I said, let's share the knowledge now. So he quickly pulled up a list of his Minecraft buddies, you know, his school and his neighborhood and all that. And we said, okay, let's do a Minecraft workshop for them. Now, that Minecraft workshop was literally concluded last weekend at my home. There were 10 kids who came over. Um, none of them, literally none, I mean, except my son and another of his buddies, none of them had any programming experience. We taught them how to write a simple hello world using NetBeans. Um, then we built a Minecraft mod. Um, I have the complete instructions to build the Minecraft mod yourself on this URL. So you can go to java for kids.java.net and just remember the main URL, java for kids.java.net. The Minecraft workshop is linked from there. So the complete instructions in terms of um, uh, what the Maven arch type you need to use to get started with the prototype plugin, all of that are available over there. Even the slides that I used for the kids are available over there. Now just to show you, I'm going to play another, this is a minute long video. Now this is after the kids build their very first Hello World program. So watch the video. Well, shoot, I don't have the sound. Let me blow it up. So I think the key part to me was these kids had a lot of fun. Their very first introduction to programming is good. They enjoyed it. And then this is like even before they build the Minecraft mod. This is just purely doing a simple hello world. And maybe NetBeans was a factor into it, you know, quick out of the box experience. JDK, all of that was experience to it. But you want to have their very first experience as a good experience. Then they will get it. Actually, I want to show something here. So if you go to java for kids dot java dot net slash minecraft dash workshop, um, it says what the workshop is about. Then you click on the link March 16th. That's when I did the workshop here. Um, it gives you complete workshop schedule on how you can do this workshop, for example, yourself. The complete steps followed in the workshop, as in what you need to get started with, you know, in case you want to run it yourself. It says what the download instructions are, what the Maven arch type is, how do you compile the plugin, how, lo how do you download and start the craft bucket server and mod the server. So very simple steps, um, but it was an extremely humbling experience for me, specifically because these kids, you now they are like elementary school kids. And I told them, oh, you know what? Give this command. So, okay, give the command. They typed it and they're waiting. Oh, hit enter. 
So you have to be very, very clear and explicit to these kids on how these instructions and what these instructions are going to be. Some other interesting facts that I found out you know, about Minecraft is, for example, um, there are 10 million, about 10 million, this is like about last week, there was about 9.7 million about a week back, paid users on desktop only, okay? We are not counting Pocket Edition, I'm not counting other editions of Minecraft, for example. The pricing is a little bit different, um, but this is the version that is most popular, desktop itself. Um, and the beauty of it is, you can go to minecraftedu.com, if you go to minecraftedu.com, that is actually meant for Minecraft for educators. So for example, you can uh, have a discounted pricing for your school. So if you want to buy Minecraft for your entire class, they give you up to 50% discount. And there are heavier discounts available as well. Just like Greenfoot, there are different forums where Minecraft educators are talking how to use Minecraft for programming. And since I, mean, I, have, I blogged about this whole concept of Minecraft work workshop, Actually, you know what? Go back to the page only. Um, on this page itself, I have a workshop report. So if you go here, you can see how to introduce kids to Java programming using Minecraft. There I exactly explain my experience on what I did, why I did, how was the experience, everything. And since this blog has gone, there are lots of folks who have reached out to me that how can we teach, how can we use the workshop material to you know, reach out to more kids. Absolutely. Take it, run with it, let us know at least, you know, that we are using the material so that we can understand it. And help us make it better all the more. All right, so I'm going to conclude with just two resources. Um, the first one I think that I found relevant is, may not be that much for elementary and middle school kids, but for really high school kids, uh, if you're new to Java, this is an excellent resource, which is an Oracle Technology Network. And then everything else I have linked from um, javaforkids.java.net. So if I go there, for, for example, this is sort of the main page of the website here. And I need to fix it a little bit. But here it talks about, you know, Scratch, BlueJay, Greenfoot, Raspberry Pi, Arduino, all different things that you can use to introduce programming to your kids. Um, and it has some resources as well, and I'll continue to add them. So if you click on, for example, Greenfoot here, it's going to tell you what Greenfoot is about, at least a quick introduction and the basic introductory links over there. All right, I think I literally have two minutes if you have any questions, and Michael is here to answer as well. Yeah, yeah, and, and that exactly, you know, my, my boy and one of his close buddies, these guys did the summer workshop. The moment they saw the logo, they were like, this is for girls. And, and that is indeed the target. So, I mean, maybe they should have chosen a different logo to <laughs> reach out to a broader audience. Yeah, yeah, right, that would have helped. I had some success with my boys with iPhone programming. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Yeah, I mean, that is one of the things that my son has been asking me. He saw that video on Ted, uh, Bustin Jeeber, and he's saying, you know, hey, when are you, when are you giving me an ADC $99 uh, license? Because I want a program over there. We should all appeal to Apple. Open up for kids at least, you know, it's the most closed source platform in the world. There are different languages. <clears throat> uh, I was actually looking at that particular scenario only for myself when my, I, I wanted to introduce programming to my son. Um, I looked at Python, for example, or JavaScript, or Ruby, and those different languages. It all depends you know, what you want to get started with. 
I mean, even if you take Java as an example, you don't have to introduce the entire set of concepts to them. Uh, when I give the Java presentation, I gave them enough concepts only in the context of their domain. So I told them what a class, oh, for example, I said, oh, think about a car. What is a car? What features car has? Oh, it has a color, it has a seat, it has a steering wheel. Okay, what can car do? It can drive, it can stop. Okay, things like that. So then I correlated that with a class. Class, properties, functions. Then we talked about what can you do with the fruit? So, oh, we can eat a fruit. Yeah, we can chuck a fruit you know, in a trash can. <laughs> that was sort of a uniform answer by the boys. I actually used that concept to explain exceptions to them. That, oh, why do you chuck a fruit in the trash can? Because maybe the fruit is not ripe. Maybe the fruit has a worm in it. So that's how you do exception handling. So my point is, independent of the language that you pick, introduce only, do the agile programming, only do the, introduce the basic concepts. And I mean, I don't want to introduce class cast exception to him all of a sudden. If he gets into it, then we touch on the topic and hands off. No, teach him them enough. Yeah. Right, right. Right. Actually, I, sh I should have mentioned that link. Oracle Academy has a wonderful set of resources um, that they provide in terms, and this works just out of the box. You know, they provide a wonderful set of wonderful set of resources for kids, for adults at different levels. Uh, for example, one of the parents was asking me, "Oh, I want to engage my kid now. Now that they know about the Minecraft workshop, how about I want to engage my kid for a high school workshop for the entire summer?" So, hey, I mean, I don't have anything re ready for that, but I'm going to be looking at different resources that are already available, packaging them up, and then saying, here you go, take it. I think personally, sorry, taking a quick deviation, personally, it is very, very fulfilling. I mean, my day life, my day job is about Java EE evangelism. That can be as geeky as you can, you know, EJB, JSPs, that can be really geeky down to the wire. Doing this was extremely fulfilling personally. Seeing that expression on the kid's face that they build the Minecraft mod, absolutely priceless. Any more questions? Absolutely. Actually, that's a very good point. <clears throat> Sometime after Halloween, he, he mentioned his desire to build a mod. Literally, our discussions changed. Whether it's driving to him to the school, whether it's on the breakfast table, whether it's anywhere, you know, we are talking about all different things. Um, and I build a lot of samples. So for example, a month ago, I was building a simple sample to compare REST and WebSocket, how much overhead is going to be on between each of them. I was building HTML5 progress bar, sending packets, echoing it back, and getting the data back. He was sitting right next to, uh, next to me while I was building the program. He said, what is, what is it that you're doing over there? I said, oh, I'm just building REST and WebSocket. So I explained him that one REST and WebSocket is. Um, but why there is an overhead in REST? So I explained him why there is a REST overhead in REST. So very valid point. Discussions everywhere change. You know, there are all sorts of questions that are coming in his mind. And as a programmer, as a developer, as a father, it's my responsibility to answer those questions back to him. Yes, definitely helped a lot. And, sorry, more importantly, he becomes a proud buddy of all of his friends that, hey, my dad did the workshop. Right. Now, that, that, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, see, my perspective is not to force him in any way. No, absolutely not. I don't want to do that. My goal all throughout has been, he's 10 years old. My goal all throughout has been to introduce him to the concept. If he likes it, I want him to come back to me. 
I'm not going to him. I'm just showing him, you know, hey, this is how you can scratch the surface. Now, for example, last week, I think he was building a mod and we were trying to explore the API, the bucket API, how we can do a particular functionality in the bucket. We couldn't figure it out how to do it. So I said, you know what? Why don't you go to the Minecraft uh, IRC channel? And then he's chatting with all the Minecraft geeks over there. Within literally 10 minutes, he found the solution and he actually built it what he wanted to do. So, I mean, my point is, you now if he wants it, he comes to me and I help him out, of course. I can't back out then. But if he doesn't want it, I'm not going to force on him at all, no. That would be wrong. Right, right. But yeah, I mean, if he has time, I encourage him, of course. As a father, I do encourage him to do all sorts of activities. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes. So um, as I was saying, Bucket is the developer API. Craft Bucket is the Minecraft server. So um, like Minecraft released 1.5, I think about three or four weeks later, Craft Bucket released a compatible version as well. You don't have to do the Minecraft server at that point of time. You download Craft Bucket and you run your Craft Bucket server, which is fully compatible, which has all the 1.5 Redstone and all those features in Craft Bucket. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we are done. I'm going to be in the hallway. If you have more questions, feel free to come by. Thank you.